Hello and welcome to an extra edition of Qi, the Contemporary History Intervention. This is week eight. Uh, we do not have classes this week at the university and my original plan was not to do a video for this uh, week, but then I saw the ongoing debate over the AstraZeneca vaccine against COVID-19 and I thought, well, maybe you should do an extra video to talk about this. First, because, well, this is a video blog about matters of current concern. And when it comes to these matters in the year of the law 2021, I think we need to do a COVID-19 video. But there was also something else that was in my head. And it's something that, well, university tutors have in their head uh, more often than not. This uh, feeling when I saw this unfolding debate, you know, come on, we, we've talked about this, haven't we? Well, what can we say as a historian about the AstraZeneca vaccine, the current debate, and generally about pharmaceuticals, well, first and most basically, it's a really good idea to be alert and keep yourself informed when it comes to pharmaceuticals. And historians are certainly not in a position to say that everything is good on this front. Every critic of the pharmaceutical industry knows about a medication that the Bayer chemical company uh, put on the market in the early 1900s. Uh, a medication against colds and coughs that just had a little side effect that Bayer did not talk about all that much. It was highly addictive. And we all know this medication to the present day because the trademark that Bayer registered for this medication was heroin. Well, you would think heroin, which eventually was taken off the market by Bayer, would say, think that such a blunder triggers a rethinking about drugs. Well, welcome to the pharmaceutical business. There was another event in the late 1950s that triggered uh, a new way to think about regulating pharmaceutics. I'm talking about the uh, thalidomide crisis. Thalidomide was a pharmaceutical from another uh, German uh, company, Grünenthal, and thalidomide was initially hailed as a miracle drug. It was a drug against morning sickness and anxiety, a sleeping pill, and actually the kind of sleeping pill that every pharmaceutical company dreams of. A sleeping pill that you could not overdose. How good is that? Well, it turned out that was a side effect. When women took thalidomide during pregnancy, there was a severe risk of birth defects. More than 10,000 babies were born in the late 50s and early 60s with missing limbs. And the pictures of these babies without arms or legs uh, made an impression and they triggered a rethinking about the case. Maybe we should look more closely at drug making and regulate this more tightly. That's the general trend when it comes to uh, capitalism in Western countries in the 60s and 70s. There was a broad trend to look more closely at what these companies were doing and control them more tightly, be it about pollution, be it about industrial safety, or be it about drugs. Well. As always, when it's about uh, regulation, there were disputes about the details. You could always uh, have different opinions on whether a certain procedure was legitimate and important and another trial was uh, called for or the, whether it was just unnecessary paperwork. But there was another event, a quarter century after the settlement crisis, that uh, triggered a broad rethinking of the case for tighter controls. The lesson from the thalidomide crisis was, well, it's always good to err on the side of caution. It's always good to check thoroughly and take time for trials, but then time is of the essence when it comes to medical issues. The event that drove this home was the AIDS crisis of the 1980s, when infections with HIV multiplied and when there was a growing awareness that AIDS was a deadly disease, there was a call for speedier medical trials, for the use of drugs as an experimental stage just because people were dying in droves. And that is the controversy that I thought about when I heard about the AstraZeneca vaccine and the doubts. Because the debate we have right now in March 2021 is exactly the debate that people had in the 1980s. Should we hold vaccination now so that we can check all the issues thoroughly, or should we keep using this knowing that time is of the essence? Well, there are two important differences uh, between the AIDS crisis uh, and our current debate over uh, COVID-19 vaccination. First, AIDS was lethal. If you fell ill in the 1980s, you knew uh, that you would die a slow and painful death. That is different with COVID-19. It's a really nasty virus that is out there but 
getting that virus is not a death sentence. Second, in the 1980s, there were activists out there who made the case for speedier medical trial. Activists from the gay community who gave a face to these concerns, people that you could talk to and that were listened to. And, and that is different in our time. Right now, there is nobody who plays a similar role. No activists when it comes to these momentous decisions on vaccination. This is a matter for medical experts and policymakers alone. And that makes a difference. If you have people in the room who tell you that you should speed up, that makes a difference in the political sphere and in the medical sphere. There is a personal dimension to this uh, video. Last Friday, I went to a medical center in uh, Birmingham and received my first vaccination against the coronavirus. And yes, it was AstraZeneca. Now, was I nervous when I received that shot? Well, to be honest, yes, I was. Um, partly for personal reasons. Um, I'm a middle-aged male, I have rather robust health, so I try to stay away from doctors as much as I can, uh, unless it's my wonderful neighbor. Hello, Imran. Um, but there are a few things on my mind really here that you know, are beyond the typical anxieties of the middle-aged male. And there were three points that were in my head when I took the decision to actually go and take the shot. First, when it comes to medical risks, there, was, there is one critical question. Are the professionals alert? And when it, do they you know, watch things closely or do they just follow the routines? Modern medicine is very much a routine business and it makes a huge difference whether people are on guard or not. And when it comes to COVID-19, I think I take it for granted now. Yes, people are watching very closely. Second, as far as I can see, the available evidence is mostly anecdotal and that is a poor guide when it comes to modern medicine. Modern medicine is about statistics, about pain, painful study of the details, about correlations, about sample size. And when it comes to as the AstraZeneca vaccine, we're talking about a sample size of more than 17 million now. That is not a situation for anecdotal evidence. We historians like storytelling, we like our stories, but I think we also shouldn't recognize when it's not a good moment to talk stories. Third, historians know how selective our medical attention is. The AIDS crisis of the 1980s really brought research into action. The uh, AIDS and HIV are very thoroughly researched nowadays, very well uh, understood. There was a lot of time and energy that went into the study uh, of uh, AIDS. And as a result, if you contract the HIV uh, virus nowadays, that is no longer a death sentence. But then if you look at this from a global perspective, there are always other threats to health that receive less attention. If you talk about malaria, well, malaria was a big issue in the 80s and 90s as well. People were dying uh, of it in great uh, numbers, but this did not receive much attention until the new uh, millennium. And if you wonder about the reasons why that is the case, well, a very big part of the explanation is malaria is mostly a disease of the global south. So where does that leave you with a view to the controversy over vaccination and about the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. Does she endorse vaccination? Well, this is a video blog about the expertise that we can bring to the case as academic historians. And one of the crucial things to think through is, well, what are the limits of our expertise? And this was broadcast on March the 18th, uh, which is the day that the European Medicines Agency was supposed to report uh, on these uh, matters and we recorded this before their verdict was out. So I will not say what you should do here, but I'll say something that historians say very often about the histories that they write, and maybe something that matters not just when it comes to the study of history. When you take your decision on whether or not you should get your vaccination, look at the full picture.